Good evening. God bless you. God bless you. This is Hamley III, Pastor Village Hills Fellowship, and I want to welcome you to our Wednesday Bible study. Today, we're going to be talking about the rich man and Lazarus in the book, Living for the Kingdom. This is lesson 99 in the book, so we're almost done. It's 115 lessons based on the commands of Jesus, and this is in fulfillment of his great commission in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Amen. That, to me, I think I've, I've mentioned it before. I'm just going to share my page real quick. So uh, this, to me, is always, it should not be an omission in our lives. And, and I knew back in the 90s when God convicted me about that, I was like, man, if there's anything that I will ever talk about in a church, if I'm a pastor, is the Gospels, is this scripture right here. So this is in fulfillment of his great commission. Amen. So I appreciate y'all joining us and I pray that you guys have had a blessed week. I pray that whoever's in behind me will stop doing whatever they're doing in the kitchen. Amen. So we can continue with Bible study. Amen. So we're going to be in Luke 16, uh, I believe 19 to 31. I don't have any specific notes uh, right now for you. Let me think. No, I don't have any notes right now. I am working to turn the building over. So I talked to the, the, um, I talked to the land, the landlord. I just felt like, I think I said before, I felt like I felt compelled to find someone else. I don't have to, but, but I have, I put some notes out there. So if you know someone in church, Texas, that's looking for a church, $650 a month and 1600 square, 1632 as far as Chris feet. So we're looking to move out Lord willing by, by May time frame. That's kind of where, where we're at right now. So I know as God is preparing us for, um, for a new season. So we're just preparing for that new season. Uh, so, uh, that's what I have now. So we'll start with a word of prayer and then we will get right into the message. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for this time that you've given us, oh God. I just bless you, Lord, for keeping us throughout this week. I thank you for the lessons that we've learned, Lord. Some have been hard. Some have not been, Father God. Some have challenged us, corrected us, convicted us, Lord God. But I pray most of all, Lord, that we will be committed to your word and, and to where you're leading us, Father God. Sometimes, Lord, the places that you you're leading us, Lord. We don't really want to go. If it was up to us, Lord, we would choose a different way. But help us to know, Lord God, that we're bought with a price, Lord God, and and that our lives are not our own, Father. And sometimes, Lord, the path that you ask us to go in looks like the valley of the shadow of death, Lord. <clears throat> but let us not fear, Lord God, because you are with us no matter where we go, no matter where you're calling us, Lord God. It's your perfect will, and we want to glorify your name, Lord. Open our hearts and minds to receive the study, Lord God that we may grow in our walk with you, Father. We love you and bless you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, my brothers and sisters. So I'm in Luke 16, verses, uh, Luke 16, verses 19 to 31. I'll give, I'll answer the questions from the book. And then, uh, where are we at in the book? I'll ask, answer the questions in the book. And then I'll give just a very short commentary. In the book, it's on page 133. Amen. Praise God that we are, we've gotten this far. Thank God for that. So Luke 16, verse 19, reading in the King James today, it says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and flying linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But he, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that 
Uh, they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from hence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, and he may, unless they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Amen. So when we look at question number one, I'm going to get back to this message here. When we go at question number one, he says here, how did the rich man live, right? And it's sub, sub, touch you, uh, sumptuously, right? In strongest concordance. So when we look at this word, right, it means like brilliantly or luxuriously because he was clothed in purple and flying linen, right? And he lived like this, right? Every day. This is how he lived. And he had a large house. He had to have a house with the gate. So he definitely had this house. So in question two, it says, begin to describe Lazarus and his life. Lazarus was a beggar and he laid at the rich man's gate. So as he laid at the gate, now this is a parable. So I'm just, I'm breaking down the parable. I know it's a story, not a real story. Jesus is giving an example. So it would give some type of evidence that the man knew about Lazarus. Whether he knew his name, what have you, he knew that there was someone at my gate. His body was full of sores and he was often hungry, right? As it says, as he desired or he was hungry, as he desired to be fed from the crumbs from the rich man's table. And then dogs came and licked his sores. And that's not something when you think about, right? If you put an image on that, it's not a good image to consider. So then when each man died, where did they go and how were they treated? Lazarus was carried by the angels and placed into Abraham's bosom, almost as a, a, a sign of comfort, to be comforted, to be cared for and loved. When you think about you being in someone's bosom, being cared for, held and loved and, and supported. The rich man was buried and he found himself in hell being in torment. So then the rich man, question four, he calls out to Abraham and what two things did he ask of him and what did Abraham say in response? So the rich man sees Abraham afar off, like I see him afar off and I see that Lazarus, the man that was at the gate, right? Because he recognized Lazarus. I recognize this the man, right? Whether or not he knew his name, like I recognize that this is the man that's been in my gate. I recognize who he is. So he cried and he asked Abraham to have mercy on him and to send Lazarus just to dip his tip of his finger in water and cool his tongue. Just that. Don't give me a drink of water. Right. Don't splash me with a hose. Just I mean, just a, a, a drop, a single drop as he was tormented in a flame, engulfed in this type of flame, tormented. So then he sees here that he can't, right? There's no way that this can happen because Abraham says, son, right? Remember in thy lifetime. And this is a, a, a message for all of us. Remember that in your lifetime, you receive as good things and uh, likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he's comforted and thou art tormented. And he said, besides all this, there's a great gulf, right? Fixed between verse 26, so that they which pass from hence to you cannot. And then neither on the other side. So that can't happen. Lazarus can't come to you and you can't come to him. So then he says, okay, look, if, 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 if Lazarus can't come to me, right? There's no, there's no hope or no ability for me to be comforted. Let me think about What's next? Because now I don't want other people to experience what I experienced. How many of us has been there before? When we're going through something and we say, you know what? I don't want this next person to go through what I am going through. 
So now I'm asking, right? In, in question five, I'm asking that you send Lazarus to my father's house. Send someone that's already passed on that has experienced the comfort of being in Abraham's bosom. Someone that understands, look, I was tormented in life. I died. I've experienced great comfort now. I maybe even Lazarus can see me being tormented. So send him that he may go and warn my brothers. I have I have brothers. I have five of them that, I, that I'm concerned about. Because maybe these same five brothers are living as he was. It doesn't say that it was. But I, I want them to be warned so that they too don't wind up where I am. That's his request, to testify. Because maybe they'll listen. But Moses, question six, Moses denied his request. And he said, because they have Moses and the prophets, they can hear him. So if we're looking at that very moment in time, Moses and the prophets were not living so he he so he could be speaking of the Torah of the Old Testament. They have the Old Testament teachings. Today we have the Bible. Right? They have what they need so that they don't wind up here. Y'all y'all see that, right? They have what they need so that they don't wind up here. So do we. So then, because he believed, right? The rich man believed that if someone came back from the dead, right? That can testify, like I said a little bit earlier, they would heed the message and repent. But then Abraham says, like, look, even if somebody returned from the dead, they wouldn't listen to him because they're not even persuaded by Moses and the prophets. And, and that kind of made me think about those times when we see movies or we hear testimonies about people that died, went to heaven or died, went to hell, or some people died and went, you know, went to heaven and hell. And then they test, they come back and testify. There may be people that are convicted about it. A lot of people may not be. We hear the message and like, wow, you know, that was amazing. And, and keep moving. We're not compelled or convicted. For me, I didn't have that opportunity. So I may not, I may see that a little bit differently because I was already in Christ when I began to hear some of those messages. So I can't, can't speak to that. So we have what we need, but then what, what is our response? So when I think about this parable, I want to ask us, like, what can we take from this? And I have four points I want to share and then I'll close. Like, I'm not... I'm not, I don't, I'm not planning to be super long. Hey, God bless you, Tierra. I pray that you're doing well. Uh, I'm not I'm not here to be super long. But looking at this parable, I wanted to take a few points from it. Like, what can you and I take from this parable as we read it? So I have four things that I'll share. Number one, the life you live on earth does not guarantee the life you will live in eternity. A lot of people, a lot of us, most of us, focus, if there was a percentage of time, like say if your day, or say, let's just say last week, you lived last week, how much, based on percentage, how much of your week was spent on focusing on your current life and what percentage of time or of your week was spent thinking about your eternal life. Whether that is, you know, I'm making investments, not just, not, not just I came and listened to the Bible, not just I read a devotional, that I was doing things like I'm being rich toward God. Remember, I'm, I'm giving alms, right? I'm seeking the kingdom. Right, I'm selling my goods. I'm doing good. I'm showing compassion. I'm doing something, not just reading. <laughs> I'm talking about reading. I'm talking about reading and praying. I'm talking about I'm doing something 
What percentage of time have you spent focusing on my eternal life as opposed to how much time we spend on trying to live our best life on earth? A lot of us may find ourselves like the rich man. We're not concerned about, we may not be ignoring different people, but we're not making investments to make sure like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm investing. Like we talk about like investing in real estate and stocks, mutual funds, 401k, all those type of things, right? You're looking for a retirement plan. I want to make sure when I retire, I got some money in the account, right? We need to make sure we have money and we have riches, we have riches in our account in heaven. So how many of us? Many of us don't focus on, right? We're focused on the quality of our lives now, but we're not focused on how we're going to live in eternity and what that looks like. So that's number one. The life you live on earth does not guarantee the life you will live in eternity. And it's important that while we have time, that we consider how we live. Amen? Number two, the second point that I want to share is that heed the message of the Bible and from the Lord. Now, no person is going to be without any excuse about the gospel. Even in Romans 1, the Lord says, like, if you see nature, right, you, you are without excuse. You know that there's a God. No one will be without excuse. Let me, I'm going to see if I can find it for you real quick. No person is going to be without excuse. But we have to get to a place where we say, right, where we say that I'm going to take heed to, to God's word, right? Romans 1 and 20. I'm going to read from the NLT, New Living Translation. It says, I'm going to read from verse 19. It says, they, no, verse 18. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Right? He's explaining this. He's speaking about a specific people. But everything we see, we're without excuse. But we have to get to a place where I'm going to take heed to the message of the Bible and that from the Lord. So that may be the Holy Spirit convicting you of sin, where I begin to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I repent of my sins. I look to become a disciple. And becoming a disciple, I don't know if I'm talking about this Sunday, but this is different. This is different from us living like everybody else. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to find a church and I'm, I want to have church and I'm have a great time and I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying myself. That I'm looking when I heed the message of the Bible. I'm heeding the message of the Lord. I'm, I'm receiving his call. I'm going to go where he wants me to go. I'm going to do what he wants me to do. I'm going to be who he wants me to be. And if you live in Christ any amount of time, you will find that he is going to convict you and confront you about where you are and where he wants you to be. And most of us will see there's a gulf between that. I need you to love these people. And you over here, like, Lord, I don't want to love them people, right? And you got to make sure you come into where God is. But sometimes we stay over here like, Lord, I don't want to love them. I'm going to stay right here. I know what you said. I'm going to ignore you. I'm going to do my thing. Okay. That's not taking heed to the message in the Bible. God has clearly told you, right? I need you over here. I, I, I've clearly told you that. I clear, clearly told you. 
So it has to get to a place where when I'm heeding the message of the Bible, I'm going to go where he wants me to go. I'm going to do what he wants me to do. I'm going to say what he wants me to say. I'm going to be who and where, whatever it comes, because my life is bought with a price. It's not my own. So it comes to a place when I heed the message that I'm going to walk as he wants me to walk. So that would mean a lot of our lives will not look like the people that are around us in the church. A lot of us, it will not look like that. God may send you somewhere. A lot of people, God, like, I don't want you living in the city that you're in. You stay in there. You've been there 10 years too long. If you would have heeded my voice, I was calling you to a whole nother city. But you, you trusting in what you got. You looking at that good job you got. You want to stay here because you want to be around your family. I'm calling you away from your family. Right? We have all these reasons why we do certain things. But the number one thing must be, is this what God wants me to do right now? Is this where he wants me to be? Is this who he wants me to be? And how can I look more like him? And there's a lot of times we may find that what we want to do is not in alignment with what he would want us to do. And we find ourselves in a lot of trouble because of that. We find ourselves on situations like the rich man, or we can, because we're not paying attention to the condition of our lives. We're not paying attention. Right? A lot of times we get so caught up in life and living the best life we can or just trying to make it trying to survive, that we don't put our eyes on eternity and where we stand in relation to that, right? We could, there could be a gulf in between us and the God's kingdom. So we need to take heed to it. So as we take heed to his message, he had the gate of my house, right? That may be someone, think about that for a second. At your house, in front of your house right now, there is, in front of your house, there's, there's someone begging for food in front of your house, laying at the gate of your house. Or if you don't have a gate, at your driveway. For most of us, that's 20, 30 feet away. Wherever it is, few steps, 5, 10, whatever it is. They are there every day. You And then think about what it looks like not to show compassion. They live that close to my house, to the front door of my house, I drive in every day. I don't say hello. I don't say anything. I don't say, hey, I have some food. I got some extra food. Can I help you find you know, a homeless shelter, a place that can get you some help if you need to? There's some people I've, I've learned that choose homelessness and don't want to uh, be, uh, come out of that. And it's a lifestyle they choose. But then it's like, how can I assist you where you are? But even in that, how do I let compassion motivate me? Right? If I look at someone that's in this place of torment, they're tormented in their life because we think of the things of having necessities of life, food, proper, you know, proper food, proper housing, proper clothing, people to love them, right? To be comforted. They're lacking. Where are we? Where's our heart? Is our heart torn and com convicted for individuals in this situation? And I'm, and I'm not just talking about like we go and do a couple things once a quarter, once a month. Because when you look in the scriptures, Jesus speaks about us doing and taking care of people, selling what we have, giving it to the poor. When you think about the, uh, Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats, right? Taking care of the six people groups, people who are hungry, people who are thirsty, no clothes, needed shelter, were in prison and that they were in hospitals. Like, how do we make this a part of our lives where we make this a part of our DNA? And for a lot of us, including myself, including our family, Right? Our family has been touched with that and convicted and compelled. Right, Where we need to step eat further, even further out. I think some of you, are, you've been following us for a while. You're beginning to see some of those initial, like, okay, what does that look like for us? We're trying to walk that out ourselves. 
and how our lives will definitely in the coming months and years begin to shift and change. What does that look like when you let compassion lead you to help others, to see a need and meet the need? Especially when it, sometimes the need that you see, it may not be within your means. Like I don't have enough money to, to, to help or I only have enough resources to give something. Allow me to fulfill the messages of the Bible, share his love, to shine his light in the world, this world of darkness. People that will see God's love through what I, you, we do together. Because there are many people that need help. A lot of people around us. So how can we allow compassion to lead us so that we don't just step over people that have a need? Amen? How can you take care of people? What can you do? I'll give you an example. You know, Yolanda and I, we had made some backpacks. We need to probably make some more. But we have some backpacks and uh, we put them in our car. Right. So if we see somebody, we need to make, put some more snacks in there. But if we see somebody in need right in the, in the bag has like some hand warmers, gloves, I don't know if the socks in there. I think there's a poncho. There's like other little little things. See somebody in need, you know, hey, here's a backpack. Right. Or, you know, how can I help you? Maybe there there's something else that that may be long standing. Right. I'm looking for somebody right that's out there. Maybe I'm going to someone or I see something. I may not give you a, a money, but then how can I maybe give you food or how can I take care, give you something to drink? How can I look after you? Because it looks like, right, you need you need help. How can compassion compel me, right? And a lot of times, and I think I spoke about this a, l- a little bit earlier, compassion, those opportunities hit sometimes out of nowhere. You just driving down the street, minding your business, and you see something. Where is compassion speaking at that point? Lastly, number four, is I want you to be able to share what you've learned with others. It's not enough, brothers and sisters, for us to say I made it, right? I made it in Christ. My, my, my you know, uh, my the earth is not is not my home, right? I, I'm I'm waiting for the place Jesus got for me, and never talk about Christ to anybody else. W- there's a lot of people we know out there that are like the rich man. Some of them may not even be rich. But these individuals, they're not taking heed to the message of the Bible. They're not compassionate. They're not doing anything, right, to place any type of treasures in heaven. They're not being reached toward God at all. And they and we know, based on who what we've seen in them, that, man, if they was to die today, they would not find themselves in a place like in Abraham's bosom, right? That was a parable. They will not find themselves in a place of comfort. They will not find themselves in a place of peace. They will not find themselves in a place where God dwells. And we know that. So what do we do to share such a message with someone else? They can deny it. See, see, you're not responsible. Or there may be times when I told you about my father, where God said he not coming to Christ from you. I don't know if I watered a seed or even planted it. He said, it ain't coming from you. It ain't going to be coming from your words, right? And there was a friend. There's somebody else. But I can be praying that they come to Christ. You know, I'm thinking about somebody now I'm going to reach out to. Where are you at? How can I share the word with you? How can I make sure that I'm sharing a message of heaven with my fellow brothers and sisters, my friends, my family members. That's another part of compassion. I don't want you to wind up in a place of of torment. So I'm going to speak to you about the Lord, about his message. So I want to think about if the life I live today doesn't guarantee the life I live in eternity. Or... I'll say put an emphasis um, on your 
eternal dwelling. So number five. So number five, I'd say put an emphasis on your eternal dwelling. So that we take time this week, today, tomorrow, no matter what age you are. You of the age of culpability, you know right from wrong, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to my kids, right? I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you. If you know right from wrong, this is you. Just because, you know, someone is uh, eight, you know, nine, ten, whatever, you're a teenager, don't mean that you died, that you're exempt, especially if you've been hearing these messages. You're not exempt. You need to come to Christ. You need to repent of your sins. There'll be torment. It's not like you've lived your life as a complete uh, complete rebellion and God's going to give you a pass because you're, you're you're a teenager. Like, no, it don't work like that. You know right from wrong. and You know the Lord. Or you've heard about God and you chose not to heed his message. You, sir, ma'am, are not considering how you're going to live in eternity because none of us are guaranteed. And most of us think like, right, I'll be I'll be 50, right, in a few days. Then, And I talk to you guys, even on here, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll be 80 years old or whatever. I'm not guaranteed to live till I'm 80. But I talk like that. So because I talk like that, we think like, oh, I got time. We almost lend ourselves to the trick that, oh, I got time. I'm young. So, you know, I got all these plans and things I want to do and places I want to go. I got time. It all, it's almost like it's deceiving us. It's still like, you know, what I got today. I got right now. I may not finish today out. You know, think about if we had a different perspective on that. I may not finish this day out. Right? People drive crazy all the time. You can walk down the street and, and somebody hit you, right? Come drive on the sidewalk. You never know what can happen, right? How am I living my life? Am I living each moment of my life in a position where it says, I, I, I'm ready, Lord? That I'm prepared and I'm ready. And not in a position where it's like, Lord, I wish I had five more minutes. I wish I had another minute. I wish I had a little bit of time because see then like like the rich man was saying he can't just he can't even get a finger dipped in water at the tip of a finger dipped in water on his tongue to cool him from being engulfed. It's too late. So I, I pray that we will take time today. We'll take time to consider the condition of our lives to right where we are and where we will be because this earth is no one's home <laughs> like this ain't none of our home no no one this ain't our home no matter how lavishly you live on earth this is not your eternal place there is an eternal dwelling for each of us that will last far 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 far, far. I ain't got enough fars greater then, yeah, then what you got right here is just going to be far greater, right? Eternity, right, goes on. So, and, I, and I want us to consider the life that we live on the other side of this one and that we spend more of our week making intentional, deliberate, right, purposeful actions toward that life because you can, as the Bible talks about, you can, Jesus says, you can gain the whole world and lose your soul. That I don't want to gain riches, gain fame, gain notoriety, gain, right, all these possessions that you can't take with you. And then end up in a place of torment. So let us think about where we are, right? Consider, remember, the life you live on earth does not guarantee the life you live in eternity. Take time, brothers and sisters, us. We got to heed the message of the Bible and not get to a place where we're just trying to hear messages feel good. A lot of people don't want to hear messages. They call it fire and brimstone. Like we need fire and brimstone to keep us right, to keep us holy, to keep us focused on the Lord. Show compassion for those in need. That let compassion, when you see someone, you see something. 
right? It drives you to want to stop. It drives you to want to do something. It drives, right? Be praying about it. Be prayerful. But it, it, it compels me like, Lord, I want to do something. I want to help meet a need. Share what you've learned with others about Christ. Share his message of love. The greatest love story ever written. Amen? And make sure you make intentional, deliberate decisions. Put that emphasis on your eternal dwelling and not just the one that you have here. Amen? Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for this time you've given us. We thank you for this message, Lord God. We ask, Lord God, that as we, as we look at Lazarus and the rich man, many of us may see ourselves in their lives, Lord. Regardless of what side we may find ourselves on, Lord God, help us, Lord God, to take heed to your word. Take heed to your message, Lord God, that we may be comforted, Lord God, for all eternity. Some of us, Lord God, may not find any comfort in this life. We find many hardships in the afflictions that you promised, Lord God, and they seem to be unending, Father. May we continue, Lord God, in spite of those things, surround us with people who will love on us and support us, Lord God, and send help, Lord God. May, Lord God, may, may those, Lord God, that are experiencing those hardships, Lord God, may they not be weary in well-doing, Father God. May they not lose hope, Lord God, in the eternal reward. But keep them, Father God, ever so close to you, Father God, that they may live an honorable life in your presence, Father. Father, I pray, Lord God, for those that are on the side of the rich man, that they will be convicted, Lord God, in their hearts, Lord God. Let the Holy Spirit come upon them, bring conviction, that they will say, what must I do to be saved? That they'll use their wealth as a means to sell what they have, to give to those that are in need, and not just to fill their own barns. Help us, O oh God, to live beyond the the uh, glamour and the pool and uh, of the world, O oh God, pulling us to live like the world just to correct us in our way, Father. We want to live with you forever, but with that comes decisions and a cost to be made. May each person listening to this message, O oh God, make such a cost and choose to sacrifice, O oh God, the the pleasures of this life and this world for the pleasures and the joy and peace that that find themselves in the next. Father, we love you and we bless you, Lord God. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. I appreciate you all joining us. If you have any questions, comments, concerns about this message, if you listen to this message, you say, you know what? I don't know God. I don't know him, but I want to know more about him. Please shoot us a message. We have a free book called Advancing the Kingdom that describes the story about God and about uh, why Jesus came. And we would love to be able to share that message with you. He talks about, Jesus speaks about counting the cost, about what it means to be his follower, to be a disciple of his. So we would love to be able to share that message with you. But if you have any questions, comments, concerns about the Bible or anything, maybe a, a personal situation you have going on, please feel free to shoot us a message. We don't charge any, any amount of money for you to ask us a question or if you have a prayer request. We'll do our best, very best to help you. Well, we'll pray for you for sure. But if you have a question or a concern or issue going on in your life, we'll do our very best to assist you how we can. And until the next time, y'all keep looking to them. Well, let me pause. If y'all got a question or comment right now, I'll pause for a second if you got something. Uh, I think we have all our other services, everything else going on. Uh, Saturday morning, we have men's study. Friday night, we'll have women's uh, life club. And Lord willing, we'll have a Sunday uh, service. Amen. And until the next time, well, I don't see see anything else. Like I took a little drink. So until the next time, you be blessed. You keep looking to the hills. I'm going to challenge you that you spend time this week thinking more about, how, about your eternal life and not just this one that you have. And you will spend time thinking about how you can be, right? Take heed to his message, right? You can be more compassionate and keep sharing Christ with other people. Amen. That's your challenge for this week. To keep thinking about that. And God will bring some of these opportunities. They'll they'll come upon you like, ah, right there. Like somebody jumping out at you. And when it comes, like, hey, I'm ready. Lord, help me. You can just say, Lord, help me. Give me guidance. Give me direction. Speak to me, Lord. Those short prayers help you along the way. Amen. So until the next time, y'all, y'all be blessed and keep looking to the hills. God bless y'all. Y'all take care.